friends, you're with us today. I'm glad for that. We've got a great passage in 2 Kings. And kids, if you've got a worksheet, I am told that there are key words you're going to listen for. And I thought I wouldn't have one of those key words, but I think I might have it. Might have it ready. So listen carefully. And adults, if you've got, you don't have a worksheet, but maybe a Bible, that'd be good, or a scripture journal, if you'd like to open that, if you're visiting with us today, we have 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Kings scripture journals available in the back. We'd love you to have one, and uh, you can use that to take some notes and follow along. And I'm going to ask you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. Chapter 4. We are making our way pretty quickly into this book. And as we come to chapter 4, I know we've taken about a chapter per week, but we're actually going to slow down. And so this morning, I'm simply going to read the first seven verses for us. So 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go outside. Borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in, shut the door behind yourself, and you and your sons pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as, and as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Would you pray with me once more? Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you, we want to be ourselves, empty vessels, our hearts open to be filled with what you have for us. Lord, we recognize that in a big family like we are, there are needs among us, and we lift those to you now, Father. We think specifically of Brittany Brown's Father Eric in the hospital. We pray for him. We pray for a full recovery. We pray that you would be near to him. Father, we pray for the Cole family and their trials that they've been going through with Declan. We pray for Declan himself. Father, we also pray for those in our congregation seeking employment. We pray that you would lead them and guide them and provide for them. And Father, for these baby cries, we thank you. We praise you. We praise you for new life. We thank you for David Vance, who's here today. Thank you, Father, for all the gifts, the joys that you have given us in our children. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. That baby was on cue, wasn't he? She? Who was that? (laughs) Good job, baby. Well, they say there are only two things in life that are certain. What are they? Death and taxes. Today, I'm going to put it a little differently. I'm going to say death and debt. Isn't that the American way? I've been in debt. It's not fun. It's more fun to get out. And do that as soon as you can. But, but I have never been, and I don't think any of you have ever been so deeply in debt, so desperately in debt that someone was going to take away your family, take away your children. Kids, how would you like that? That your mom and dad get in trouble financially and to pay the bills, you got to go to work and you got to go somewhere like a workhouse indentured servitude that's exactly the place where we find our desperate woman here in this story of course not by her choice she's not been irresponsible this is a plight that she is in because she's got two young boys and she's lost her husband prematurely debt slavery indentured servitude call it whatever you want but she is in some pretty dire circumstances and get this 
It, it comes after her husband has apparently invested himself, invested his life in ministry, right? But his life's now gone, and she has met the first of life's two certainties, right? And now with a knock on the door, she is about to meet the other one. Here comes the debt collector. All we know about this woman is that she is one of the wives of the sons of the prophets. And we'll remember who these sons of the prophets were. These were a prophetic group under Elijah. And now they're under Elisha's leadership. We learned in 2 Kings chapter 2 of at least two different groups in two different cities. One at Bethel, the other at Jericho. There could have been, likely there were, other groups in other cities and, and as for how many of them there, there are in total, we don't know. We know Jezebel killed some of them, but there are many, many left. Jericho has at least 50. By the end of this chapter, we're going to see a group of 100 of these sons of the prophets. But other than this, that she is a wife of this, uh, one of these men, she refers to her husband as your servant as she's talking to Elisha. Other than this, we don't know really much of anything else about this family. We don't know what city she's in. We don't know how old her boys are. We don't know their names. We don't even know her name. She is literally a nameless widow. And yet there is a theory about her identity, an interesting one. It comes from the Jewish historian Josephus and actually several other rabbis who wrote what they call Midrash, Jewish writing, right around the time of Jesus. And they actually suggested that she was married to a man named Obadiah. A man named Obadiah who has actually appeared in Kings, 1 Kings, earlier. Back in 1 Kings chapter 18, this was the chief steward in King Ahab's house. But Obadiah was also secretly a faithful believer in God. And here's what we're told about him in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 3. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. And Obed, now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. The theory goes that this is Obadiah's widow and sons. And as for the significant debt, maybe it was created by feeding a hundred prophets. But that's speculation. And all we know for sure is that she now comes here and approaches Elisha in her great distress. And that in itself is a pretty sad statement about the very sad state of affairs in this kingdom. I want you to understand, Israel was not supposed to be a place where this kind of thing happened. Widows were not supposed to find themselves in this bad of a predicament. This, remember, is supposed to be the promised land, right? The land of plenty. And yet because of Ahab and his household and their wickedness, the only plenty this land has seen is plenty of drought and plenty of what comes with drought, which is famine. But more than that, even when times might get tough in Israel, widows like this woman were supposed to be able to appeal to someone for help, namely Israel's king. The king was supposed to be a protector, a source of justice for the vulnerable. I want you to hear what one of their greatest kings, Solomon, himself wrote over in one of the Psalms. This is Psalm 72, verse 2. May he, the king, judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. And yet it seems like Ahab and his sons have done precisely the opposite. And hence our widow now has to come to the prophet. No doubt clinging to some scriptures like this one in Exodus 22, verses 22 and 23, where it says, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, God says, I will surely hear their cry. The Lord gives that kind of instruction because the Lord has a heart for the widow and the orphan. 
As we read elsewhere in the law, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 18, he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. And so here we are. Our desperate widow is forced to turn to a prophet rather than her king for mercy. She needs the Lord. And when kings can't be counted on, you go to the Lord's man, to the man of God. She cries out to Elisha in verse 1, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. She knows that Elisha knew her husband personally, and apparently pretty well. He had been faithful to Yahweh at a time when such faithfulness could be really costly. He swam against the the tide of his culture. He swam against the current of his government, and he faithfully feared the Lord. And yet, now God has called him home. Good for him, an eternal reward, but not for people he leaves behind, because with him gone, his loved ones are facing real disaster. Because as she says, the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. Now that sounds pretty horrible because it is. But please understand that in the ancient world, this was actually pretty common practice. In fact, among the surrounding nations, people around Israel, there were no restrictions on debt slavery. You owe somebody money and you can't pay. They can take you into debt slavery. And if the debt's large enough, they can take your family too. Make them all their debt slaves, indentured servants, until the debt was paid in full. That's what it was like in the surrounding nations. In Israel, however, the law gave more protective and merciful provisions for the people who found themselves in death slavery. I want you to hear this in Exodus 21, verse 2. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh year he shall go out for free for nothing. No matter what the size of the debt, if he still owes you 20 more years of work, if it's year seven, he or she goes free. Leviticus was even more specific. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39 through 41. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers. Protections like these were built into the law, freeing indentured servants and workers, and and even returning land to the original family in the 50th year. But waiting for the year of Jubilee, or hoping that a wicked king is going to uphold God's law, neither our prophet nor our widow have much hope for that. Elijah doesn't tell her to go to the king. Elisha, I should say. He doesn't say go to the king. In fact, what he says to her in verse 2 is, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? She tells him that all she has left is one small jar of oil, which is really probably like a flask, probably saved for cooking. So clearly this is extreme poverty. But what Elisha does next is very interesting. He's going to involve her in the miracle. The the actions he's going to tell her to take are going to be part of the means by which The Lord provides for her. She will be an active participant in the solution. Verse 3, he says, Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. Now, if there is some kind of famine in the land, as there recently has been since the effects of the drought under Elijah might still be lingering, it makes sense that her neighbors might have a whole bunch of empty jars and vessels laying around their houses. They too have been struggling. And she is to go to each of them and to borrow as many of these empty vessels as she can. And the fact that this woman does it, that she unquestioningly obeys him, says a lot about her faith. From verse 6, we learn that she actually sends out the boys. They're going to be out there doing all the bringing. 
And she's going to be inside doing all the pouring. And Elisha's instructions are also very specific about how and where this miracle is to occur. Not out in the open for everybody to see. Don't let everybody gawk at you while you're doing it. It's not going to be like a lemonade stand out in the public where you're, you're pouring, pouring, pouring. This is not going to be any kind of a magic trick to get people's attention. No, she's to do it very privately. Verse 4, she's told to go in, shut the door behind yourself, and you and your sons pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside and keep pouring. And our widow does just that. She leaves the prophet, or he leaves her. She goes inside, shuts the door behind her, and she begins to pour. More jars, boys! Go get them! And she keeps pouring, and they keep bringing them, and the oil keeps flowing. Keep going, boys! Bring me more! And vessel by vessel, they are filled with this valuable oil. The boys keep bringing more. She keeps pouring more. And by verse 6, every jar that she's got is full. Nothing empty. And she says one more time, boys, go get me another vessel. But her son tells her, there aren't any more to get. We've asked every neighbor and everybody's out. They're all here. And just like that, our narrator tells us that it's then that the oil stopped flowing. Verse 7, our widow, she goes out and finds Elisha again, the man of God, and she tells him everything that's happened, how the house, it's full of vessels, I can't even walk anywhere. They came to me empty, and now they're all full of that precious, valuable oil, and it, it's way more than I need to pay the debt. And what does he say to her? Go sell the oil, pay your debts, and then you and your sons can live on the rest. Pay your debts. Literally, another translation says, go redeem your boys. Go redeem them from that servitude. And the Lord's provision not only does that, it satisfies the debt, but it also provides ongoing support for this family's future. Isn't that a great story? <laughs> no fireballs, nobody died. I mean, the guy died before the story. No bears coming out of the woods, eating kids. Kids, you missed that one. That was good. I remember the first time I heard this story in Sunday school. I think there was flannel graph. But you know what? Today I want us to take a little deeper look into this story. I want us to kind of slow down and give us a chance to reflect so, so we can make some observations together. Because I think there are some really powerful things here. And I think there are a number of observations to make from what God is like to how God likes to work, to what he sometimes requires of us as his people. And then I want to finish with one final observation that's going to link us to the gospel. Because we get more than a glimpse of the gospel from Elisha today. But first, let's get started with those observations. Here's the first one. Observation number one. Sometimes we serve God faithfully and sacrificially and great trials still befall us. Sometimes we serve God faithfully and sacrificially and still great trials befall us. You ever wonder what it was like to be the wife of one of these sons of the prophets? You ever think about that? I'm pretty sure it was not a, a lucrative career, a prestigious lifestyle. You're not making lifestyles of Israel's rich and famous or anything like that. But worse for this particular wife, as verse 1 opens, it's total tragedy. This woman's situation is disastrous and heartbreaking. A humble family in not just grief, but also in crushing debt. 
Again, we're not told how or what he died from or what the circumstances were. All we know is that a husband and father has prematurely passed away. So he's not just another day older and deeper in debt, as the song goes. He's dead, and he's left his family buried in debt, leaving behind a very desperate widow in some very frightening circumstances with her children about to be taken into debt slavery. Sometimes we serve God faithfully and sacrificially, and still great trials befall us. Do you know someone for whom this has been true? Have you heard a story about someone? You'd say, yeah, that that is what happened. That lifelong servant, someone who's been faithful to the Lord, who's maybe served him sacrificially still. They do all that and tragedy befalls them. A terrible car accident on a mission field. A sudden shocking diagnosis, whatever it is. But today what I want us to do is I want us to look at this widow because even in her great distress, do we ever hear a complaint against God or even against the prophet? All we hear is a helpless cry, which is different than a complaint. Her faith remained intact because Who does she immediately seek out? The man of God. And that ties to our next observation. Here's the second one, number two. Number two, God is as concerned with small-scale affairs as he is with massive ones. Massive. God is as concerned with small-scale affairs as he is with massive ones. I want us to remember what's been happening in these first few chapters of 2 Kings, okay? What's been happening? Well, it opened with a royal king. The king of Israel has a great fall. The prophet is brought into his court. A prediction is made, not a good one. Next, we've got the grand departure of Israel's most famous prophet, and it's quite a spectacle. We've got chariots. We've got a whirlwind. And then in the next chapter, we have a massive military campaign, 2 Kings chapter 3, the battle of the four armies. These are national affairs, aren't they? And God's in them, and he's working and speaking into them. These are what you could even say are regional world affairs. Kings, commanders, battles, great prophets calling down fireballs, pronouncing judgment. And yet we come to chapter 4 right here. And all of a sudden, things slow down, and they get very, very small and local, don't they? Small scale. We've got a humble widow's house with a closed door. A couple of boys running around the neighborhood, harassing neighbors for jars. But it becomes a miracle that supplies what this humble family needs. There are no fireballs here, no kingly edicts, no great prophecies. Again, no chariots or whirlwinds, just a widow and her two young sons. But God is as concerned with this small-scale affair as he is with the massive ones. So we ask ourselves, is God concerned with the big things in our world right now today? National affairs, elections, World figures, conflicts across the world, large-scale gospel efforts even. Yes. And when I say concern, please don't think I mean he's wringing his hands. What am I going to do? He's firmly in control. He is working out his providential will in all things. But then we come to our own individual lives, our everyday lives, don't we? Your private life and concerns, my private life and concerns and needs, these much smaller scale personal struggles and trials and fears and needs that occupy your mind, maybe even this upcoming week. God is just as concerned and God is just as involved. God cares for the needs that you and your family, if you have one, are facing. 
He cares for those needs every bit as much as he cares about the world stage. And just in case this isn't clear from our example in the story, let me just share with you or point you to the words of somebody else who said this. We could turn over to Matthew 6, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 and 26. This is Jesus. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Jesus actually goes on. Matthew 6, verses 28 to 30, he says, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. And if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven... Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Not one sparrow falls to the ground apart from the Lord's knowing. The very hairs of your head are numbered, and the scriptures tell you that he loves you and cares about you. And he is interested in even the small affairs of your life. And that really opens the way to another observation we're going to make. Observation number three. Sometimes seeing the Lord's provision requires us to step out and work in faith. Step out and work in faith. Maybe you noticed this miracle hasn't happened all by itself. Maybe you notice that our widow doesn't get to kick back and put her legs up, her feet up, and watch it all unfold for her. No, this is a miracle that she is very much going to be involved in. And not just her, but her sons too. First, she's going to need to go seek out the man of God to ask for help. Then it will be those boys running the neighborhood from house to house, collecting the vessels. And then it's going to be all the pouring the pouring, the continual pouring. This miracle happens in the outworking of her faith. And she and her sons are called to participate in it. There are no spectators here. They are participants. And when the prophet asks her, what do you have in your house to start with? And it turns out that it's not much. One scholar reminds us that God often likes to begin his work at the point of our inadequacies. I want to say that again because it's not my statement. God often likes to begin his work at the point of our inadequacies. But he can take whatever meager thing you have and I have, or in her case, that small flask of oil, and he can use it as a symbol of our helplessness as he works his provision. And he uses us. He uses his people as participants rather than spectators. That's why the door shut back on this day. There are going to be no spectators, only participants. She is busy inside, working in her miracle. And in the process of all of this, what's happening is her faith is getting built. And I think for those boys too. Can you imagine what this woman was saying as she first began pouring from that little flask and she, she fills the first whole jar? I imagine it was bigger than the flask. And her boys are watching and they're like, Mom, that's not right. That doesn't make sense. How can you pour from one littler jar into a bigger jar and it fills it? And then it's two vessels. And then it's five. And then it's ten. How many did she end up with? Vessels of all different shapes and sizes. It's whatever they could find. Were there, were there dozens in the house? A hundred? All we know is that there was more than enough to settle the debt and that she and her sons had enough to live on the rest. 
So I don't know where some of us might be today. Maybe you have a need or are in a difficult circumstance. Maybe it's something sudden and unexpected or maybe it's something that's been a long time coming. Small need, medium-sized need, huge need. Here's what I know. Sometimes seeing the Lord's provision is going to require you and I to step out in faith and work in faith. So, so ask the Lord for help, pray to Him for help, and then be ready when a course of action presents itself. That's a third observation, but I've got another one, number four. And this one's connected to it. Number four, God will often meet an immediate need even while preparing us for what's ahead. God will often meet an immediate need even while preparing us for what's up ahead. So all the jars are filled, right? Every last one those boys could find. And then we read, it's then and only then, only when there were no more jars, that's when the oil stopped flowing. Can you imagine if our widow had maybe only filled like five jars of oil and then she looked at them and she sized them up knowing the value of the oil and she said I think that's enough we can pay our bills and then set that flask down you imagine that but God was prepared to give her a whole lot more wasn't he God will often meet an immediate need while preparing us for what's up ahead and he may do it in material ways, like he did here. And he may do it in other ways, too. He may prepare you for what's up ahead emotionally. He may prepare you for what's up ahead, up ahead relationally, spiritually. Over in the New Testament, in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, the apostle will talk about generosity and cheerful giving. And he actually points to a principle. And here's, here's the principle he points to in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. He says this, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, that's God, he will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Now here in this passage, obviously Paul's literally talking about finances and generosity. He will supply your need and as you're faithful, prepare you for even more so you'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. And sometimes the Lord does exactly that. He meets our needs and prepares us for what's up ahead in ways that are financial and sometimes he does it in ways other than the financial. Increases the harvest of our righteousness in all kinds of ways that we will need it up and ahead in our lives. And so I would say trust him and go to him and be faithful to him with all that you have, however little or however much. So those are four observations from our story today, but I'm not going to stop until I give you one more. This last one, it focuses our attention on the man of God, on Elisha. Because although he only makes a brief appearance here, he shows us something very, very significant. So our last fifth and final observation is this. There's a Redeemer at work on behalf of the helpless effectively redeeming them from death slavery. There is a Redeemer at work on behalf of the helpless, effectively redeeming them from death slavery. Of course, the Redeemer is Elisha. In, in many ways, Elisha actually functions like a kinsman Redeemer 
Maybe that's something you haven't heard of before. Maybe you're familiar with the idea of a kinsman redeemer. It appears in the Old Testament book of Ruth. The story of Ruth. It talks about how a man named Boaz came to Ruth, and Ruth was a helpless widow. And because he, Boaz, was related to Ruth's deceased husband, Israelite law said that he could serve as her kinsman redeemer. And today, really, we've seen Elisha, the prophet, do something very similar to this. Because, again, we have a, we have a family connection here. Is not this deceased woman's husband described as one of his sons? One of the sons of the prophets? So spiritually, he's family to this family. And, and he becomes their kinsman redeemer and effectively redeems them from debt slavery. You know, the Bible teaches us that we all have a kinsman redeemer too. Someone who does what Boaz did. Someone who does what Elisha did. And his name is Jesus. And he's redeemed his people from circumstances that are dire in more ways than just physical or financial. He took on flesh to redeem his people from all of our dire circumstances. And most of all, our dire spiritual circumstances. And he left heaven... And he joined our earthly race, didn't he? By taking on flesh, by becoming one of us, he became part of the earthly family, our kinsmen. And he came to do a work of redemption on a cross to redeem all of us out of our debt slavery. Of course, ours wasn't financial. We know that ours was a debt that we racked up and continue to rack up each and every time we sin. But Jesus knew this was his mission. And he knew it from day one on this earth, which is why he walked into a synagogue one day and picked up a scroll and read this in Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor. You want to know what another word is for that? Jubilee. Jesus came to proclaim jubilee and freedom for all who will come to him. Will you come to him? Will you humbly, quiet, maybe your self-righteous efforts and come to him? Will you stop pursuing your own selfish path and come to him? Our story this morning has been about a widow and a man of God. But you know what? It points to an even greater man of God, a man of sorrows. And he was a man who didn't simply let oil flow to provide. He let blood flow. And by his blood, our debt is paid. And we have everything we need. Let's pray together, shall we? Can you stand with me? Let's pray as a team comes. Jesus, you are a man of sorrows, but Lord, you did it for the joy set before you. You scorned the shame of the cross, Lord, to come and to be our Redeemer. You took on flesh so that you could be kin to us, Lord that you could share with us in our plight, bearing upon yourself the debt, the massive worldwide historical debt of the human race, so that if anyone comes to you, Lord, there can be release, there can be freedom and forgiveness. But Lord, we know we must come, and that every person must choose to bow the knee, And so, Lord, we pray that if there be any of us here this morning who have not taken that step, Lord, that that we would come, that we would not wait any longer. 
And Father, as we look at this principle that, that, that is the gospel, that is the good news for us, and see it worked out in a real-life story in this Old Testament book of Kings with this widow and her sons and the prophet, Lord, remind us, reaffirm to us, those of us in need, that you are a God who is concerned about, yes, even the small scale of our individual lives. And that you are a provider who hears our cry. And so, Lord, we take refuge in that. We take solace in that. So build our faith, Lord. Use us in whatever way you choose. Lord, we are open for your will, your timing. And we give it to you. And we thank you. And we praise you. And we pray this in the name of your Holy Son, in Jesus' name. Amen.